Welcome to the Inspired Painter Podcast. My name is Jessica Libor and I am your host. I'm an artist, educator, and curator. And if you are an artist who wants to create an amazing and fulfilling career and life, this podcast is for you. I'll be sharing information and inspiration that has worked for me and art world insights and tips, as well as interviewing some amazing, amazing people within the art world. So this, the goal of this podcast for me is to help you feel in control of your art career and empowered to be the best artist that you can be. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to today's podcast guest, which is Tanya Val. Tanya is an Alaska-based abstract painter and florist whose work is inspired by nature's warmth, adventures, and all the good feels. Her artwork explores themes of individuality, freedom, and sustainability with the use of warm tones, expressive brush strokes, and layered textures. Her artistic approach is purely intuitive with little to no planning, allowing her to experiment and develop each piece based on the feeling and emotion of the moment. Tanya is also a photographer and floral designer and her floral work takes an artistic approach, allowing her to paint with flowers. Her style is wild and romantic, while taking, a, taking nature as a guide in illustrating its most organic beauty and its feeling. She also makes all her own plant pigments by foraging in her home wilderness of Alaska and hand creating each dye and pigment. I found this so fascinating, and join us today as Tanya walks us through the inspiration for her work and the process she uses to create her pigments, even giving us a recipe to try one of our own. All right, I will introduce Tanya in a second, but I also wanted to thank my sponsor, which is Era Contemporary. And um, Era Contemporary is a gallery and media website serving discerning art collectors through exclusive art events, articles on contemporary artists, and art consulting. Um, their next exhibition is a group show featuring contemporary realist artists titled The New Pre-Raphaelites, and it will be debuting in September. And um, it is sponsored by Harcum College. And Era Contemporary is currently accepting submissions to be in this epic virtual exhibition until August 1st. If you are an artist who would like to apply to be in this show, or a collector who would like an invitation to the virtual event, please visit www.eracontemporary.com for more information. And I'll put the link somewhere around here as well. All right, so without further ado, let us welcome Tanya Val. Okay, great. Well, everyone, welcome Tanya. Welcome Tanya to the Inspired Painter podcast. And um, I, I'm just so excited to talk to you. Um, so I saw your work through Emily Jeffords and um, I saw that you guys worked together and I was so intrigued with your use of plant dyes and um, you know plants uh, paints that you make I think it's so interesting and I'm a big nature girl myself so I was just like oh my gosh making art from nature how cool is this so I just felt like I had to talk to you so so excited thank you for having me yeah so um tell us a little bit about yourself when did you first get started um you know getting interested in art in general i would say i started getting interested in art um, back home i am originally from ukraine so i grew up um, in ukraine until i was 11 years old and then we moved straight to alaska after that to be with family and I would say just my entire childhood was filled with my mom who was a single parent and she just really made our daily lives really bountiful. We would go foraging, we would paint together, we would cook together. So I was just always really interested in nature and just having sticks and rocks and things in my pockets. And I, I yeah, I just, I just loved it all. And uh, when we moved to Alaska, um, I was still quite a bit younger, but I was always interested in art. I, my mom and I would do painting classes together. We would go to local artists and have them teach us classes. So we were always sort of painting, but I always just knew that painting would be part of my life 
uh, as a career, but I didn't know what that looked like at the moment. And when I went to the University of Anchorage, Alaska, which is their local college, I went to school for painting and graphic design because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I always just sort of thought that I would, I should have a backup plan just in case art does not work no. out. <laughs> You know, I know. It sounds, yeah, I, I know a exactly. Typical story, but like as an immigrant and as mm -hmm. as someone who was raised by a single mom, it was really important that you felt really comfortable where where you were. And you know, yeah. she was always, you know, very um, helpful and inspiring, and always wanted me to have whatever I wanted. And art was always sort of just this hobby, fun thing we did together. But I think I open her eyes now to seeing that there's definitely a career in that. Yeah. And so I went to school for graphic design and painting. And after graduating with a bachelor's of arts, I dove right into an advertising world with graphic design. Mm -hmm. And I was a graphic designer for five years mm -hmm. and just quit my full-time job last fall. So congratulations. That's yeah, amazing. That felt like a huge hurdle and like weight off my shoulders where I can really focus on my art because it always felt secondary and I never wanted it to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess with, um, with all of that being said, I was always sort of pursuing kind of a few different uh, creative fields. I was a wedding photographer for five years. Mm -hmm. I am still a wedding florist and, um, Foraging was always sort of a part of something I did with my mom, but it also was a big part of my floristry work. So mm -hmm. I sort of was just always really curious and trying new things, but at some point it all just clicked. And mm -hmm. I found that bringing in the floristry and the foraging and the art making and just painting outside mm -hmm. could all be one thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, just last year, I was gifted a book called Make Ink, A Forager's, a forager's Guide to Ink Making. And Ooh. I think that's when just the, you know, it all just sort of opened up to me. And one specific chapter from the book, it's a beautiful book, and I highly recommend it if like somebody has not heard of it before, but mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a chapter specifically that speaks about foraging in the wintertime. And just, just that chapter, I feel like shifted my whole perspective on art making because uh, Logan, the writer of the book, he, Jason Logan, he wrote, um, essentially when you are foraging and it's winter time, you have the opportunity to look at nature from different perspective. So mm -hmm. you're looking at the, these bare colors, nothing <laughs> is going on, there's no life, but then all of a sudden you are seeing the birch bark, you're seeing these cones, you're see seeing different textures, and you're able to imagine what is possible in the summertime. And so I went foraging in the winter last, not this past winter, this two winters ago, mm -hmm. and I was like, whoa, I can't wait for summertime. I can't wait for berry season. And mm -hmm. it was just so exciting. Just everything changed. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. That's so amazing. I love how passionate you are about this. And um, yeah. I go for, I'm curious about the wildlife and the nature in uh, Alaska because I live in uh, Philadelphia. And um, so I live in a part of Philadelphia that's, I actually live next to um, a national park. And so I go walking like or running every day there. And I love seeing like all the little things, like I saw a chipmunk last <laughs> week and like a red crested um, woodpecker. It was like right in front of me. And um, I love like finding different species of things and being like what is this plant and um I, I just love it so I'm curious about what the what is the nature like in Alaska because I think when most people think of Alaska they think of like icebergs <laughs> it's it's very common to not even know anything about Alaska yeah so to me I live uh I live in a like the biggest city in Alaska it's called Anchorage and mm -hmm. it's just like a big, it's like a small big city, essentially. We have everything mm -hmm. we need here, but uh, I can go out 10 minutes uh, on a 10 minute drive and I can be on the ocean in the mountains immediately. Mm -hmm. And I can go in any direction and just find an enormous amount of inspiration for art, um, for ink making, for paint making. It's just unbelievable. Um, mm -hmm. In the summertime, we have uh, about uh, 12 hours of daylight. So we call it the midnight sun. So mm -hmm. summertime is when we all essentially just 
kind of get out of hibernation and start living again because yeah. winters are long and they're cold and they're dark. And then mm -hmm. come summertime, the days are longer. Everything is growing so fast. It's just like bursting with energy and everyone around also is bursting with energy. They're just like, mm -hmm. I want to go out and do stuff. It's a nice day. We have to take advantage. But then there's yeah. also like this guilt where if you don't do something in the summertime in Alaska, because it's so short, that like, you yeah. feel horrible by yourself. Oh, so, that sounds so amazing of, though. Yeah. So just like lots of outdoors um, adventures and just being outside mm -hmm. is kind of the life here. <laughs> That's amazing. And is that um, one of your paintings I see behind you? Yeah, this is actually a collection I did before I went full force with um, natural materials. But mm -hmm. the collection itself also inspired sort of everything because, mm -hmm. yeah, it was just all based in nature and being outside. It was called um, Catching Fields, and it was just about summertime in Alaska, actually, and how, mm -hmm. how amazing it is and how mm -hmm. nice it is to be outside and enjoying it all and taking it all in and being in the moment. Yeah, um, but I'm, ha I'm happy that I had a phase with art and where it was sort of acrylics and oils and now I can put that knowledge of just creating into something that's actually totally crazy and different and has mm -hmm. its own process. Yeah, yeah, I think that, I don't know, I don't, I think it's very rare to be able to do this, especially at like a high level and to really just like run with it like you have. And um, it, it's really beautiful. I love the, uh, I was looking at your work um, before, you know, I reached out to you and I was just like, this is stunning. Like, even though the colors are, they're, the colors are very like pale and delicate, um, but they're so, they're so ephemeral and just gorgeous. I love them. Um, how, how was the transition from um, working in acrylics and if you, have you ever worked in watercolor? I'm sure you have. I feel like I've just dabbled in everything, but um, last mm -hmm. few collections I had before the natural process was mainly in acrylics. Mainly in acrylics. Mm -hmm. And working with the plant dyes and the plant paints, is that more akin to working in like watercolor or oil or acrylic would you compare it to? I would say, so there's kind of two phases to my process. I actually am just working with uh, water-based. So an ink uh, is generally created with water. And then mm -hmm. I also mix raw pigments, which are, you know, a lot of like rocks and soils in nature. And then I mix those with oils. And then uh -huh. just being so controversial about mixing oil and water um, <laughs> in one piece. So that was kind of challenging because I honestly, I love the way like water-based uh, materials look, but I just could not help myself. And I needed that like thick cakey texture of mm -hmm. oils and or acrylics to be part of my pieces because that's just why I love texture. And that's kind of why I fell in love with art was just because that like just texture, that like feeling, that like depth of pieces that yeah. I couldn't just create with water-based inks. Yeah, and we're going to get into um, like maybe like a recipe and how to a little later on. But um, I'm curious about like the historical aspect of what you do. Have you found examples of, you know, other artists or historical um, people who have done what you've done, even if it's like the cave paintings? Absolutely. I mean, pigment making and art and art and essentially just the beginning of time was created how I'm making paints now. Mm -hmm. um, both in the sense of just mixing rock and breaking it down to a powder and then mixing it with oil and then the same taking like berry juice um walnut ink and then creating paint and ink from that so literally it goes to the beginning of man doing art uh in general as far mm -hmm. as the history of it so it's pretty yeah. incredible and I would really love to learn more about the ritualistic and like spiritualness of it because different rocks uh, come from different areas in the world. And mm. I, I want to kind of know and be aware of where things come from and mm. what specific ochres mean and symbolize. And so mm -hmm. I have still so much to learn. I'm so excited about it. Yeah, it's interesting. So what are some of the challenges of working with um, plant-based inks? Because what I've heard is that it can be um, difficult to prevent fading or discoloration. And then 
um, you know, if things flake off, have you had any trouble with that? So I essentially took an entire year to experiment and see what I can do with uh, natural inks and pigments. Mm -hmm. And the road was so challenging. It was, I thought it would take me a couple months to get the hang of it. And it took me a year to be comfortable with what I was doing. But essentially, I just had to have an entire mind shift as far as creating. I had to let go of control. I had mm -hmm. to essentially just let the pigments and the ink guide my process. I, mm -hmm. It took a long time to even get to that stage because, you know, as artists, we want to be part of it. We want to be making decisions. But at yeah. some point, I was just like, this is just going to guide the course. And I, yeah. I can't be resistant to it because that's where it would just get overworked. Um, and essentially, the biggest problem I had was because I was so used to creating at least 12 layers with acrylics and oil paints mm -hmm. while in school or in previous collections and artworks, I could not any longer layer. So the wow. layer had to be really minimal because the inks and the paints were so time consuming and creating that I couldn't just on the whim be like, I can cover this later. It's like mm -hmm. this sort of guilt comes in where you're like wow i spent like four hours four days creating this ink and if i'm not careful i will have to cover it up because it's you know it's just part of the process where you yeah. really have to learn a whole new way of thinking and for me i had to learn to essentially just uh also think of ink making as just this abundant beautiful wild thing of its own mm -hmm. so i like to think that it's probably going to change if it's you know a natural uh alive thing uh it's probably you know in the process of you learning how to make inks you may have inks that go moldy mm -hmm. and just learning what each ink and color um, does and um, works how it works with other elements it all is just like this learning beautiful abundant process where you just have to embrace it because mm -hmm. That is just the beauty of it. You're, you're making art with nature itself. So mm -hmm. I had to just kind of just entirely shift the way I thought about art making. And I do know that like colors may shift, colors may change, but I found that if I am really sanitary when I create inks, if I um, do my research and I make sure nothing is crazy toxic, um, because you could be foraging for something that could be toxic if you're not aware of. And then that is just something that's fuming in your home if you are mm -hmm. cooking your inks at home. So mm -hmm. just really being aware of what you're doing, how you're foraging, being sustainable with your practice, and then just sort of letting it take over. Mm -hmm. And I essentially just prevent it. I've, so far, uh, the pieces that I've kept from my last collection are doing great. They're not in direct light and they're all varnished. So they're varnished. Oh, you can varnish them. Varnished. Yeah. So the, I didn't use a natural based varnish when I did my last collection because honestly, I couldn't find one. But just recently, a company called um, Natural Earth Pigments, they just released a, an all natural varnish. So I'm excited to play with that. But after I varnished, everything just sort of settled in. And okay. I feel like nothing has truly changed dramatically, okay. at least. And it's been a, a, almost a year. Oh, that's good. That's good to know. So do you usually work on paper or panel or what, what do you feel like is the best surface? I've really just enjoyed making uh, paintings with canvas the most. Oh, okay. Um, I would mm -hmm. love to step into making the canvas myself, um, mm -hmm. just raw uh, materials, but I feel like I just need to take it one day at a time. You mean um, like leaving the canvas? Yeah, I mean, like, you know, in art school, you would have your frame and then you would oh, okay, okay. the canvas okay, to it, yeah. but it would be, you know, ungessoed and raw. Mm -hmm. um, that's mm -hmm. all. <laughs> Nothing okay, cool. Not when you get the whole like, canvas. That would be insane. <laughs> that is insane. Oh my gosh. You better be charging like a million dollars for that thing. Yeah, that would be <laughs> um, so, right now, you, you do use like gessoed canvas, like regular yeah. gesso. Yeah. Um, just for the artists who are watching who you know, they may want to try it on their own. So, um, so regular art materials can support this. And then you, you can use a regular varnish on top of it or from natural earth pigments, they have a, a natural one. Okay, cool. That's awesome. Yeah. So 
how does your current environment play a part in what you do as far as like foraging for the things? And then have you ever imported, um, you know, objects or um, ingredients in order to make more exotic formulas? <laughs> Ooh, I like the way that sounds. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that there's multiple layers of how I'm making art. There's this whole sector of me taking rep repurposing food matter to create ink. So mm -hmm. I would use avocado pits and save those and create create ink out of that. Or there's also, you know, like onion peels, there's cabbage, there's a whole assortment of color that could be found just in your fridge. Um, mm -hmm. Even things that are, you know, not really edible, like onion peels are something you just throw out. That's not even something you would eat, but you know, like avocado pits as well. So there's a whole element of just your daily life that can be used into paint. And then there's just this bounty <laughs> outside my front door where I can pick for berries, I can use cones and I can use nature in a more, I feel like it, when I go foraging, it just gives my work so much more purpose. I feel really inspired. I feel a little bit emotional. I feel <laughs> like mm -hmm. very purposeful in life. I just mm -hmm. feel like it just, before I'm even making, I'm just outside, I'm taking it all in, I'm being present and I'm gathering from the earth. Mm -hmm. And that to me is just so beyond beautiful. And then when I process and create inks or pigments, it just becomes this just massive, overwhelming feeling of wow <laughs> like am I really doing this this is insane but then it's like okay how do I put my art practice to this how do I make it my own and how do mm -hmm. I make a difference with mm -hmm. um, with what I'm doing and it's it's very complicated to me uh, it may not be but it just feels really beautiful and emotional at the same time if yeah. that makes any sense. I feel like that's maybe the first time I've expressed like exactly how it feels. Yeah, um, no, it's, it's like you're internal. It's like a, you're creating something from like inception to like the product and it's like totally it's it's like you're the vessel you're carrying it to fruition. Yeah, it it feels like an out of uh, out of body experience on honestly. It just like mm -hmm. it feels like I'm just like this host and nature is just there to shine for others. <laughs> Amazing. I love it. And I really got that from looking at your photos, which we're, we're going to talk about too, um, which are just like breathtaking the way that you photograph your work. Um, the work is beautiful, but then the way you photograph it with nature, it's just like, oh my gosh. It's so it just like, it really took my breath away. It was so amazing. Um, that's, that's really great. So um, let's see here. So how do you balance making your art and also running a business? What does that look like for you? I feel like right away out of art school, you're told that you're probably not going to make it as an artist. I mean, I've yeah. literally had professors saying, oh, about 1% of you will be teaching. And it's like, oh, great, cool, can't wait, you know? <laughs> and um, you might know, it's, it's kind of like, it's hopeless, but good luck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, here's your resume. Um, yeah. I feel like I just generally needed to make an entire shift of, of my mind and think of it as a business in general, mm -hmm. as any business we've had with wedding photography, with floristry, with, um, we just opened up a houseplant shop. Everything is just, um, needs to be from the perspective of a business owner. And mm -hmm. so if you, if you take it in from there, you plan, you are strategic. I feel like the art becomes more enjoyable because you are able to feel confident <laughs> that you will sustain yourself as an artist because there's just so much unknown and truly there still aren't that many resources for artists um there definitely are and with emily's help i mean like i feel like a true artist running a business mm -hmm. um and yeah emily is amazing we actually we actually went to school together um, that's really we were cool. in the same, yeah we were in the same class and we took like the our drawing classes together and yeah I, I it's just amazing to see how her business has exploded and um, how much she's helping other people and I love her podcast and then yeah. I discovered you and yeah she's awesome so that's great 
Yeah. Did you take her um, art making work or her other classes? You know, whatever Emily does, I'm right there behind her, honestly. <laughs> like, whatever she does, if she's just like out, I don't know. She, she, whatever she does, I'm there with her. I just yeah. like, love her energy. I want to be around her. I want to just be listening to her at all times of the day. So, <laughs> yes, I took her class. It was incredible. It was also in her mastermind, which mm -hmm. I feel like I've just gained 24 new friends, and they're all incredible and part of my life now. Mm -hmm. A few of them are going to be in Alaska retreat. A few of, or another one of them is just going to be visiting Alaska. So I've just made lifelong, beautiful friends because Amazing. of them. And you, you're running these retreats? Um, Emily and I are hosting a retreat together for the first time. And I've just only done workshops locally. So this will be okay. my first retreat. Awesome. When did you start hosting workshops? I started hosting workshops um, pretty much whenever I was really excited about something. <laughs> you know, it could be as, uh, I was a hand letterer for a hot two years, uh -huh. um, and I was doing classes locally. Um, I would be doing like floral classes, so uh, about, at least twice a year, I'm just doing mm -hmm. something, just mm -hmm. kind of sharing my love awesome. um, for nature. Honestly, that's just kind of what it all always. Yeah, comes that's amazing. And then um, how does your photography play a role in your art business? And I would love to get into the more specifics about how you kind of arrange your compositions to really show off your art in the best light. Absolutely. Uh, photography, I feel like, has been the core of my art career, core mm -hmm. of the success of my art career. Mm -hmm. um, because I was able to do it professionally, I feel like I started gaining an eye for simplicity for communicating a story for capturing a moment and when I started focusing on photography for my art business it shifted a whole different perspective as well because at one point it would be distracting and I would just be so excited about photographing and then it would take away from the process and the creating a the creating process itself but then I also took photography as such a huge tool of inspiration so you know when I'm outside I'm always I always have a camera with me and the photography also inspires future collections so it works as a tool in so many different aspects from creating new work from just having inspiration from capturing moments while I'm creating and I've kind of just become a little bit more in tune with myself and my own process where I can be like, okay, magic is happening right now. I'm going to capture it, not just for myself to remember this moment of me creating and good things happening, but also um, knowing when to stop, knowing to, to be like, okay, this works. This is great. Let's put the camera away and continue what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's just been kind of an incredible tool in so many different ways. Um, and I think because I did it consistently, that's been a really important factor too. Yeah, yeah, amazing. And for the artists who are listening, what's your favorite camera to use for photographing your artwork? So right now I am using a Fujifilm digital camera and it's called Expo 2. I actually have it right here because it's always whiskey. <laughs> Expo, Expo 2? Expo 2 and it's a Fujifilm. So it has sort of the style of an old school film camera, but it's yeah. entirely digital and it's really lightweight. So when I was a wedding photographer, the cameras were so insanely heavy and the yeah. lenses were heavy. So if I can find something practical and that gets the job done, I am all there now. Cause That's I don't amazing. really need the heavy camera anymore. <laughs> so cool. Um, do you ever work in Polaroids? You know, I have, we have a few film cameras around and I feel like I kind of just go through phases of mm -hmm. really loving that analog, analog feel. Yeah. Um, but I, I wish I was more consistent with it, truly. Yeah. <laughs> I went through a phase where I got like a, uh, a Polaroid camera and I got all these different kinds of films and I would like go on walks and take the Polaroids. And I mean, they, they ended up like, and then I found out like ways you can double expose. And then I was like, oh, these are kind of like abstract little paintings. Like it's kind of cool. Yeah, it's amazing what you can do for photography. And I, I, I believe photography is an art, you know, just as much as anything else, because it's, you know, creating compositions and using coloring and lighting. And it's 
you know, a lot of the same things that artists, you know, like traditional fine artists do. So I think that that's amazing. Also, my sister is a wedding photographer. Oh, so, lovely. Yes, what she does is totally art. So, really? yeah. Um, so let's see here. What kinds of artists inspire you? Like as far as um, like painters, like what kinds of artists inspire you in your own work? So I... I feel like I have this pool of abstract expressionists that I've always loved because mm -hmm. art school, you get to familiar, familiarize yourself with the past and history and how abstract work got to happen. And honestly, like Helen Frankenthaler has been just like my idol in all the ways. And she worked on raw canvas too. And I'm like, okay, one day this will happen. Um, mm -hmm. but like, honestly, I really love just the abstract expressionists that were women. I feel mm -hmm. like that was such a hard time for women to be artists and painters competing mm -hmm. with like Jackson Pollock's of, of the time. Yeah. And yeah. I just praise them about all the hard work and, and history they did get to make. But mm -hmm. I also now just think of that question as a little bit more expanded because a lot of what I'm making now is also inspired by a couple of different uh, mediums. So natural dyers are a big part of like my learning experience and just creating with nature itself. Mm -hmm. um, so people who dye fabrics with nature, there's mm -hmm. a whole pool of people there. There's people who are um, pigment makers and foragers for pigments. There's a whole pool there. And mm -hmm. then there's artists who also make inks from mm -hmm. nature. So there's just sort of this beautiful realm of inspiration from so many different ways that mm -hmm. I just take it all in whenever I can. Also, I hoard so many books on all the sub subjects. So it's just yeah. not, you know, it's, it's great, amazing. but <laughs> need so more cool. shelves. <laughs> I really admire it. I think it's, it's so cool. It's something I'd love to learn about more, um, especially, so I work mostly in oils, although I started working in inks recently and oh. it's really fun when you, you know, an ink, painting is so fun when you, um, you know, when you don't want to, you know, get into the whole oil process, which is like extremely involved. And I always feel like every oil painting I make has to be a masterpiece. So, yeah. <laughs> but that's just like my thing. But like with ink, it's like, it can be fun and, um, and interesting. I just did this one yesterday. Um, it's, uh, the girl from Labyrinth, the movie. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. Just like, um, you know, for fun, but, um, but I love, I love the inks and, uh, what but, but I don't, what, which ink did you use? I used, I have it actually right here somewhere. It's, um, it's a, it's a really gorgeous, uh, it's right here. Gris Nuage by Urban. Ooh. Yes. And they have all these very subtle colors that are just gorgeous like this is like a it's like a pale gray with hints of like blue and purple and it, it just like melts so beautifully I have another rose one um but but I I find that um I I, I feel like to make all the uh supplies it would take me so much time that like then I wouldn't have time to paint but that's my own <laughs> mental block but for you it seems like it's um uh, you know it's part of your art is to make that yeah Absolutely. And yeah. there's just so much patience involved. It's, it's crazy. Like I have to have days for just make, making ink. I have to day, have days where I just get to make yeah. art because mm -hmm. I get too excited. <laughs> and just yeah. like, it just takes t time is, is of no relevance at that point. <laughs> right. That's amazing. Okay. So let's give our listeners, um, if you could just give us one recipe of a plant-based ink or paint that we could make if we wanted to try it. Absolutely. So the general structure of an ink would be your material. So say we have blueberries, then you have your binder. A lot of the time I use liquid form of gum arabic, and then you have water. So that is, that is the general structure. You have your material, binder, and water, and that essentially creates an ink. <clears throat> mm -hmm. There's a couple of different components that go into the ink process itself and um, making sure that you preserve it properly. Mm 
Hmm. Um, to do kind of like the, one of the most fun and simple recipes, I would suggest trying out like blueberry ink. A lot of the time we have berries in the freezer or just around mm -hmm. and they're really accessible. So say you have some blueberries and you cover a pot um, with water. You, um, a lot of the time with berries, I like to use like a potato masher and just smash the berries just so the ink becomes a little bit more mm -hmm. alive. It starts sort mm -hmm. of like expanding its particles and you essentially just do a boiling process. So very similar to how you'd make jam. Um, so you would boil the berries for, bring it to a boil and then I like to simmer. So you would do the simmering for about 30 minutes. And a lot of the time I'm just testing with paper strips to see if the color is intense enough for me to stop the ink process. And mm -hmm. you are just reducing the water and leaving pigment there. And then yeah. after that, um, or during the, the boiling process, I like to add vinegar and white vinegar and salt. And that works as a mild preservant and it makes colors a little bit more vibrant. And mm -hmm. then I let that cook, um, do its magic for probably 10 more minutes. And then I use a coffee filter a lot of the time and I filter out all of the yummy berry chunks and um, juice, a little juice happens. Yeah. <laughs> <It> happens. <laughs> um, I love cooking so I feel like a lot of the time I talk about ink as like oh, in the kitchen. And, yeah, you know. <laughs> well, that's awesome. So, yeah. um, so when, you, when you talk about adding the vinegar and the salt, let's say that you started with one cup of berries and one cup of um, one cup of Let's say you start with one cup of berries and two cups of water. Does that sound right? That sounds, yeah. A lot of the time, I just like to cover the surface with mm -hmm. water of whatever I'm cooking. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, then, um, and then you add some vinegar and salt. And how much, like a teaspoon of vinegar? Or? I would say about a teaspoon of each is great. Okay. Yeah. So, so a teaspoon of salt and a teaspoon of vinegar. Yeah. Oh, that's a lot of salt. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know you, I'm like a salt freak, so I don't use nice, beautiful, tasty salt <laughs> for, yeah. for ink. It's just like cheap stuff. But, um, okay, cool. Yeah. And, and then, so, and then, so you boil that for like 40 minutes, it sounds like, mm -hmm. and then you um, strain it through a coffee filter, like a flat bottomed paper coffee filter. Yeah, you can do that. You can also use a fine mesh strainer. So something that really kind of takes away the pulp. Uh, you mm -hmm. don't really want any food matter. So the finest filterization process that you can kind of get your hands on. Ah, okay. Now, would you say putting it in the coffee maker? Um, so general rule, rule of thumb for when you're creating inks, I recommend having specific tools, cooking tools that you only use for inks. Oh, so okay. A lot of these tools that I have, I have designated for that. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you're just experimenting, you can probably just use um, something you use at home, but just do a good job cleaning it out. Yeah. And if you add gum arabic, I wouldn't use, I wouldn't add the gum arabic to your solution that you're going to be cooking with. So I, I would mm -hmm. add the gum arabic, say, in the jar that you will be painting out of or using Got it. for your... Like eating. at the end? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so we filtered, we filtered the boiled mixture. So we have it, let's, let's say we have it in the jar now. And mm -hmm. it's like one cup of this blueberry colored ink. So then what's the next step? Then I add a few drops of wintergreen oil. You could use um, thyme uh, and I believe a whole cloves. So there's a couple of different essential oils that you can use to preserve and that really helps uh, to prevent mold. Oh, wow. And wow. So, add, yeah. so what, what were they again? Just for the wintergreen people. Oil, so one, one of the three I would say are the most known to me. So winter, either wintergreen oil uh, mm -hmm. thyme and uh, or whole cloves. So a lot of the time people cook with whole cloves and they would have that more accessible. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I didn't know that any of those were preservatives. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and then how much gum Arabic, liquid gum Arabic would you add to this mixture at the end? I usually just do like a few drops. Um, oh, based oh, okay. on like the amount that you have, um, I usually do a couple drops. If I work with like a little bit larger volume of ink, then that I would do a little bit more. Okay, and that will basically help the ink stay suspended in the water. 
exactly. Yeah, it just kind of makes it all one family. <laughs> um, cool. this, this works as a binder. So you can also use like gum Arabic to create watercolor paints. So you would just use, um, say, raw pigment that you could get at any um, art store or at any of the um, makers that work um, with earth pigments. Mm -hmm. And you would just add the raw pigment with gum Arabic, but it would be a little bit more like 50-50. Mm -hmm. And that would essentially be a watercolor paint. Wow. And then it would just like dry down to be like a hard exactly uh, watercolor palette. Wow. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. I never knew. And then, so back to the blueberry ink, let's say we've done all this, we've strained it, we've added the, the wintergreen and the cloves and the thyme, and then we've um, put a few drops of gum arabic and we've mixed it all up and we've put the lid on now does it need to be refrigerated and how long does it last so refrigeration for me has been the best uh way to preserve the color and the um the light fastness of the ink um so i do recommend the fridge when whenever possible um mm. yeah yeah and um, how long would that last, like before you were like, eh, I should probably make another batch instead? Yeah, so I don't like to use too much because a lot of the time if you, so uh, an ink could go moldy even in the fridge if you didn't, um, if you didn't sanitize your tools really well. So mm -hmm. if you sanitize your container where you're boiling and the tools that you use, you kind of are just creating this beautiful sterile environment for mold and things not to get access to. Mm -hmm. And then when you're also filtering, if you filter really, really well, no food particles would be able to sort of spread that bacteria and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. I also just sort of started to embrace if mold does happen, I either scoop it from like the top of the jar and just toss it. And I usually just do the reboiling process again. So oh. if you do find mold, you know, I don't always throw it out unless it's just, I don't know. I haven't had anything dramatic happen. If mm -hmm. mold does occur, which a lot of the time it does, <laughs> it's okay. Embrace it. Mm -hmm. um, just get rid of the mold and then just do the boiling process again and then filter it again. So that kind mm -hmm. of helps you. If you do have an ink for an extended amount of time, it also has a lot of, a lot to do with the material itself. There's different components of um, mm -hmm. of the structure of the color that just is so potent and won't essentially go bad it just mm -hmm. sort of depends on what the material is itself okay so there's like walnut ink that does not i mean i have have had a walnut ink in my studio for over two years and it's not refrigerated and it's in perfect condition mm -hmm. so it just sort of vastly depends on the material itself Wow, very cool. And then um, what are some of your favorite like materials or inks to make? Mm. So I just did a 30 day challenge where I created inks consistently every single day. And it mm. got a little bit overwhelming because some of the inks I had to cook for at least a couple days because mm. I would notice, so I would essentially start making an ink, multiple varieties of ink at the same day just to see if one of them needs more cooking time. Mm -hmm. So even though I was posting one ink a day, there was definitely a lot of overlap where I was like, okay, this needs more time. I'm seeing what's happening here. And so it really opened my eyes to looking at food differently, looking at nature differently because I was like, oh man, day 10, what do I have to, you know, like what else am I gonna make ink out of? And it became really interesting. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would say my favorite inks that I've made so far have been avocado pit ink. I just can't get away from the beautiful rusty orange. It's my whole world. I love it. It's mm. my, my life's color palette. Um, <laughs> I love that. That's one, one of like my most favorite. I will never not use it. I mm -hmm. really loved um, using blackberries and cherries and raspberries. Um, a lot of the time you can play with different teas. That's a really accessible ink to make at home. A mm -hmm. lot of the time the teas you have at home will just produce insane color. Um, mm -hmm. You may have already noticed that, you know, you're like, wow, yeah. this hibiscus tea is just so insanely bright. It's like, oh, yeah. let's see what happens. Yeah. It's like 
cup of tea for you, cup of tea for ink. That's just how yeah, I Yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, do you ever paint with coffee? I, coffee was one of the days that I experimented with. Mm -hmm. and I really enjoyed it. I think I would have to probably filter it and reduce it for maybe a little bit longer. But yeah, it was mm -hmm. a beautiful color for sure. Yeah. And that's one of like the standard ink colors that you can create. There's some information on ink making and there's a good amount of uh, materials you can experiment with. Um, and coffee is definitely one of those that's very accessible. That's awesome. Um, I, okay, so maybe this is my connection to it. I did an installation while I was in art school and um, I took like hundreds of letters. So I had these letters made. Um, they were like historically accurate love letters. And um, so what I did was I put, I soaked, I tried tea first, but the tea wasn't strong enough that I had. And so I, I soaked all these letters in coffee and then like distressed them and like made this whole environment that was very like historically inspired. And I just remember it was, it was really fun working with the coffee and seeing, you know, it's, it's a beautiful, soft look, like working with these plants because coffee is a plant as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, all right, so where, what is next for you this year? What are you excited to work on? Um, I am really excited to do the Alaska retreat here um, in Alaska. It, it's going to be, we have a few spots available and you can learn all about the retreat and the dates um, on my website, tanyaval.com. Mm -hmm. And I would say my next step would be creating a collection of work. Mm -hmm. I just feel a little bit set back from my yearly plans with, you know, the pandemic and everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> As everyone else. Um, mm -hmm. So I just really want to get back in the groove of creating a little bit more frequently. And mm -hmm. um, I, would, I am planning a landscape collection. So I'm really excited to kind of connect the landscape into a painting collection. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and when is the Alaska Retreat? So the Alaska Retreat is going to be from July 14th through the 17th. Okay, very cool. And people can find out about that at tanyaval.com. And I'll put that in the show notes as well. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Sounds exciting. The Alaskan summer. You made it sound so like bucolic <laughs> and amazing. <laughs> I know. And it's, it, it, it feels so much more, not much more important, but it feels like something that all the artists just need to do a little bit more mm -hmm. as far as just connecting to nature again and just finding that peace and mm. you know, being a little bit more present because yeah. just kind of finding yourself again, I think, as mm -hmm. an artist has been a little bit more of an intention recently. <laughs> yeah, I think that's really important too because we are, I mean, we're, you know, we are organic beings as well and we're a part of nature. We're not separate from it, you know, so I think it's really important to realize that's why we're so much happier when we're in nature and you know that's why we're healthier when we consume nature and when everything around us is informed by it is because we're part of it and just to recognize that I think it's so powerful so that's I, I just think it's so amazing what you're doing making all these inks and um, you know your artwork is all about that and I just think it's so amazing and um, so where can people find out more about you and collect your work? So I am pretty much frequently can be found on Instagram. It's tanya.val and mm -hmm. um, on through the website. And they have a newsletter on there if you want to sign up. So that's the easiest ways to kind of follow along. Awesome. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Tanya. I really loved getting to know you through this. And um, I'm sure our paths will cross again. We have mutual friends and um yeah I'll, I'll consider going to your retreat that sounds amazing too so yeah, we would love to. yeah absolutely and I'll, I'll be following your work and we'll definitely stay in touch and if anybody has any questions for Tanya feel free to reach out to her and I'm sure she'll be super happy to talk to you so thank you so much Tanya and I'll I'll talk to you later thank you Jessica bye bye all right thank you so much for listening to today's podcast if you enjoyed listening, it would mean so much to me if you would like and subscribe if you want more notifications when this kind of um, interviews come out. Um, in fact, if you screenshot your rating um, and send it to me on Instagram at the Visionary Artist Salon or at Jessica Libor Studio, I will give you a shout out as a thank you.
I also want to let you know that I've created a gift just for you from my heart that I am so excited to share with you. It is a free guide called 30 Days to 3K, the definitive guide to authentically increase your online art sales. In this 15 page guide, I share how I'm creating amazing results in selling my art online while retaining the worth of my art and feeling authentic doing so. I am sharing the process that has worked to get results for me. All you have to do to get it is go to my coaching website, www.thevisionaryartistsalon.com and enter your email and it will be delivered right to your inbox. I hope it brings you so much value and let me know how it works for you. For those of you who are really ready to transform your career from the inside out to experience more abundance, creativity, and success, I encourage you to consider my completely personalized coaching program, the, the Artist Soul Mastery Academy. And in this one-on-one -on -one coaching program, my mission is to empower you um, to become the artist that you've always dreamed of being by helping you to remove internal blocks and step into the powerful and worthy artist that you are really meant to be. For a limited time, I am doing free 30-minute explore calls to find out if this would be the right fit for you. To apply for a call, you can visit my coaching website at www.thevisionaryartistsalon.com Shoot me a DM at Visionary Artist Salon. Um, yeah, I'm here to chat. And uh, thank you again for listening. And I hope that this really inspired and served you. And I can't wait to talk to you soon. Remember that you are already worthy and everything you make is an expression of your truest spirit. Now go forth and create.